Okay, welcome to the Shape, Rat and Roll podcast. Uh, this episode sees me chat to one of the Welsh rugby legends, um, the one and only Tom Shanklin. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for taking time out of your day to, to have a chat with myself. Um, how are you coping with this this lockdown, pal? First off, it's a pleasure to be on here speaking to you because I know you're paying me, so it's great. A um, bit of work. <laughs> <laughs> obviously i'll declare it um no lockdown's been fine mate um it's been it's been tough in ways but you know everyone's in my family are healthy there's there's no, been no issues it's just trying to keep kids active really um how old to... are the kids well, i've got an array mate uh, i've got a 10 year old an eight year old and a one year old Oh, you've got your hands full then at the moment, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, the, I mean, the toughest part is keeping them active, but also I'm not working as well. So the good thing is, you know, I can be around and, and help out as much. Um, so, yeah, look, it has. I have to say it's positive. It's been positive. Um, it's been it's been tough, like, for many people, but in different ways. So I can't complain, mate, at all, because I know there's people it's totally the, on the opposite scale. Uh, just yeah, we, 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 we've been... It's, it's the same up there, so, you know. We've been, um, you know, a lot of... You know, it, it's like a bloody ghost town where I'm from. You, you know, you drive around. What, what I will say, I've been fortunate in as much as you know, uh, um, myself and my son have been able to do some training as well because he, he's obviously got a fight coming up. Where not everybody's in that um, situation where they, they're in the same household as somebody that they can go and do something with. But yeah, unfortunately, my my kids are grown up now, so I'm gonna the stress of three youngsters running around. I can only complain to people in the same situation as me i've got to be careful otherwise you've got to choose your words carefully because you know there's some horrific stories that have gone on during this period so um i'm grateful that um everyone's got their health health is wealth yeah and, and, and fingers crossed i'm hope you know particularly with our gym that we'll have some good news tomorrow with um the welsh assembly addressing us and yep. you know, hopefully some of these uh these restrictions will be uh be lifted and we can try and get a little bit of normality back uh, no i agree Right. Well, what we tend to do on these um, these podcasts is, we, you know, we, we, we there's a lot of lot of people that'll be familiar with you, and you know, some people not so familiar. They're not they rugby, so it's just trying to get a, a bit of a background. So, how old was you um, when you started playing rugby? Is it something you've done all your life, or was you a late starter? Or you've done it ever since you was a kid. Um, I was probably quite a late starter. If you look at like kids now who are playing rugby at sort of six, seven, eight, nine years old, you know, I didn't probably start till around. 11 or 12 you know had i started earlier imagine how good i would have been now um (laughs) i played all sports you know i played mostly played football um but played tennis played cricket and it was only really um about 11 years old when i switched from playing um football for tenby um to joining the the tenby swifts the rugby club it was only it must be about 11 or 12 when I switched and I just thought actually you know I like this I've always sort of been a, a typical boy you know like getting dirty like fighting um, wrestling that sort of stuff so it just suited me and uh, and it's something that I've just I've loved it ever since you know I, I had a taste for it and that was it I was hooked is that where you were brought up in Tenby? yeah I was born in um mother and father both Welsh but I was born in London but moved back to Tenby when I was fairly young and then grew up there for you know the majority of my younger childhood really and my dad's from there my mum's from there all of aunties uncles cousins all from that area so if you know it's probably somewhere you'd call home that would yeah. have to be it yeah are your parents still alive do they still live in Tenby? yeah my dad does um mum lives in bath now but aunties uncles all saunders foot um kilgetty all around there I've got um, a static caravan down there. Um, I, I've gone there ever since I was a kid. My grandparents brought me up pretty much on, you know, touring caravan holidays down there. Yeah. I'm based in a place called Tavern Spike, which is just outside of Saundersfoot. Oh, okay. My mate's got a pub in Amroth, which I go to a fair bit. Um, the new inn. Um, it's closed yeah, at the moment, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, he's desperate to get it open, and so am I, because, you know, I've, I put a shirt up, a couple of shirts up in his pub, uh, which means I get a free bar. So. <laughs> that th- those type of areas as well, you know, holiday resorts. They 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 must be really struggling. The you know the community in these times. It's, it, they they totally rely on seasonal seasonal yeah. uh, income coming in, and uh, at the moment they they've got absolutely zero. No, and Next, by the you know, time COVID's going to be honest, and that's going to be another couple of months without any. Yeah, you know, winter's coming up now where they, you know, they don't rely on that. It's, it, it is this period now, so yes, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. But you know, if you can survive this period, then 
I think um, I think it'll you know, create the, a bit of resilience. Yeah. yeah. I also, I th I'm, I'm hopeful that lots of people take a bit from it and don't take things for granted because um, you know I, I I've got a, a a large group of people training at my gym and I'm forever the you know hard on them about not training up for sessions. The amount of emails and messages I'm having now saying they'll never, I'll never have to chase them up again. They won't take it for granted so much now. So fingers crossed. Them. Um, yeah. Well, I'm not, I'm not turning down a social event now. That's my new. I'm not turning down any social. If I get asked to go on a social, <laughs> that's it. I'm going. I'm not saying no. I can't. I've got to have the kids. Yeah. I'm in. Brilliant. Right. So you started your rugby when you was like ten. Um, for for those that don't know, your dad was a, a Welsh international player as well. Um. Was he one of those dads that always wanted you to get the oval ball in your hand or did he just let you find your own path? No, nothing. Not like that at all. Um, obviously, I knew he played rugby, um, but, you know, he played in the 70s and he, he had four caps for, for Wales. But, you know, there's not exactly loads of footage of him playing, you know, like yeah. there is today. Yeah, yeah, so it's not like I could watch old videos of him and say, you know, I want to be like him. Um, not at all. No, he just... Obviously, you know, he, he played sport. He was active. I think that was a big part for, for him was just me doing something sporty and I've always been that way uh, try all different sports um, if there's any advice to give to youngsters it, it is that you know make sure you have a, a cross between you know rugby football cricket everything because they all they all interlink you know helps with catching it helps with motor skills helps with hand-eye coordination um, and I did everything um, it was only really when I was probably 15 or 16 that I actually realized I think you know, rugby is probably my strongest sport. You know, this is the path I'd like to go down. Um, but no, always supportive of, of everything I do. Watch watch me play. Um, would always come to games, but terrible watcher. My mum was mad. She would have like a rattle. She'd have flags, whistles, <laughs> the lot. Like really embarrassing. My yeah. father, though, he'd sort of, he'd be pacing up and down behind the posts. You know, he couldn't watch a lot of the time. Um, just needed what? to know that I was all right. Yeah, so a, ner a nervous spectator in as much then, because you know it's some playing. Yeah, did yeah. you um, did you feel any weight of expectation when you played as a youngster because because of the international link with your dad? No, not no. none whatsoever. I mean, I got referred to as son of Jim for a long, long time. Yeah. You know, probably the only last two uh, the last two years of my career did they actually sort of say Tom Shanklin. Um, you know, on its entire you know on its own rather than you know <laughs> son of Jim. Um, but no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, exactly. So no, not at all. Mine's gone the opposite way. I, you know, everybody used to know me for who I was, and now I get referred to as Jack's dad. So yeah. it's it's quite humiliating for me. I've got about twenty years of that to come as well. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, when you said it was about like fifteen, sixteen, did did you win any um, international honours at the younger age groups, under sixteens, youth, any of that? No, no, a late developer. Um, but also at that age, I'd moved back to. To London as well, um, or to England, should I say? Um, so my route was playing at London Welsh. Um, it was playing for the Welsh Exiles. Um, so you'd play now and again against teams in Wales. But I mean, the big thing for then, you know, at that age, is people scouting you. I played for like count my county um, at the yeah. time, which was Middlesex. Can I stop you, Tom? How old was you when you played for London Welsh? When when you joined? Uh, I was around fourteen years old. Oh, yeah. I think. Um, and uh, so you know in terms of me getting scouted um, a Welshman playing in England you know was very limited so no no real international honours then it was only as I progressed sort of up the up the ranks I suppose of London Welsh to sort of the first team um, that people started to take notice and um, I got capped at uh, a Welsh 19s a Welsh 19s mm. obviously Obviously, back in the beginning of your rugby career, it's a little bit different to how it was now. You know, we got the regional scene. The regionals weren't around, I'm guessing, when you first started playing a very good level of rugby. So, at what age did you sign, like, your first professional contract? I signed, like, a, um, a bursary when I was at London Welsh, which was, like, for £3,000, um, which basically covered a couple of nights out in London. But <laughs> it was... Um, it was 1999, I think, I'd... I'd signed at Saracens and that was for a little bit more. Yeah. Um, that was like a young apprentice scheme and there was lots of us players on, on the same, you sort of mix and train them with uh, professionals, with your college, with your university. Yeah. So I did that. Um, but then, you know, the year after I tried it again, but you know, I needed time to focus on one thing and it was very difficult having to 
play rugby in North London, train every day, and then try and make an afternoon lecture in West London along the North Cirque and South Cirque. So it was um, a complete nightmare. So I sort of deferred indefinitely at university and ploughed everything into rugby. So I was, I would have been 19 years old when I sort of signed really my first professional contract. And that was full time then. There was no working alongside it. It was it was just hundred percent rugby. Yeah, hundred percent rugby. Um, didn't have time. I mean, if you want to, you, you just don't have time because you want to train full time with the professionals at the club, with the full time, with the the likes of your Francois Pinas, your Tim Horns, your Thomas. Kett. You want to train there as much as you can to learn from them. You know, you you're young as well, so yeah your body's developing as well. You've got to yeah. plow, you know, the, the fitness into you. You've got to plow the weights into you because you're still not physically um, at that level yet. So um, a lot of us were in the same boat and a lot of us did the same. We plowed everything into rugby and um, look, I, I'm glad I did. I didn't get a degree out of it, but you know, I, I lived a pretty good life for 10, 12 years. Yeah. And a, and a big, a big, big team as well for your first contract Saracens as well. You know, one of the, one of the premier teams in Europe, you know. So, um, d- did you get a bit of stick as a Welshman playing for a for an English team back in those days? A little bit, not much though. Yeah. Um, you know, as you could tell, I don't really have an accent because of you know where I was yeah. brought up across the bridge and everything like that. So, um, but a little bit, but not much really. I mean, um, it's all part of it's all part of it, really, isn't it? You know, it's not as if they all started calling me Taffy at at uh, <laughs> <laughs> Saracens, and also, you know, I had. Um, and Adam Jones there as well, second yes. row. Um, yeah. yeah, he came He came as well. So he was on a sort of similar contract um, to me. So safety in numbers. What sort of age were you when you when when you realised that you were good enough to become a professional player and that was something you was going to dedicate your life to? Was that when, you know, around that period, 18, 19? Um, probably not quite then because you, you've just sort of broken into a team. You're getting paid yeah. um, a small amount to, to be there. But... Um, it was, what was it? I think it was about £10,000 it was. So, you know, you have to be careful about how you spend your money, especially when you're young and you want to go out and party all the time because rugby's not that professional. Um, but I think once you start to get a few first-team appearances, and it didn't happen straight away for me. Um, it took me a year or so with injuries and, you know, your body growing as well. And I had yeah. trouble with um, quad muscle, you know, which just wouldn't repair. Um, but after you sort of get a taste of sort of five or six, seven games at, you know, in the first team, you think actually this is this is what I want to do. This I could, if I'm sensible, if I'm careful, a little bit of luck, you can make a career out of this. And if you're good enough, so it was late on really that probably 20 years old, I realised actually, you know, I could make a decent living out of this. Yeah, uh, th- that realisation comes as well with, with 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 experience. Any sport, I say, typically as you know, you move up levels from like an amateur to a professional level. You're always going to have that little bit of doubt in your mind until you've actually experienced that that, that game time, or, or yeah, uh, and then the confidence builds when you've had a good game and you think, Do you know what, the guy I've just played against for, for for eighty minutes has been an international and have more than held my own, and that only that, that brings you on as, on as a player or, or any athlete in any sport, I believe as well. You know, that's coming from from me from a coaching point of view. Yeah. yeah. With um, with, was you at Salisons when you had your first Welsh cap? Yes, I was. Um... I was 21 years old and I mean, 21 years old now sounds quite old, doesn't it, to get your first cap because there's players coming through at like 18, 19. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Saracens, uh, I just had a, a really bad injury actually um, in the middle of the season. I was, was training and um, felt um, like a, I landed awkwardly on my calf, felt like a bruise. And after about five minutes, couldn't run, went into the physio and um you know, they could see something was up because I was in quite a bit of pain, even when they were touching my calf. So they were they were quite clever and they sent me to get what is a dynamic ultrasound scan, which is a bit like when you're pregnant. And I'd burst the main vein or, yeah, the main vein in my in my calf. So blood was just pumping out into my calf. And uh, that was, um, that sort of was quite a big red flag. And they sent me to straight into surgery um, where I spent a week in surgery Um uh, but it was like, it was sort of a severe acute compartment syndrome, basically. Um, but anyway, you know, once once the scars were healed on my shins, and I've got some real good scars, it looks like a shark bite, um, I was fine to go and managed to make the end of the season then, played a few games, and then got the call for the 2001 tour to Japan. How did that feel? 
That must have been, um, um, uh, you know, I, I, I say, Stan, when you when you represent your country, there's only a small select few ever have the, the opportunity to do that. So it's difficult, I suppose, to put in words how that feeling was. And for your dad as well, I'm guessing, because, you know, he would have been a really proud father at that moment as well, being a former international. Yeah, look, well, I went on that tour and I didn't expect to get capped. Um, I just went on tour because I thought... Uh, well, I, I just thought that, you know, this is a great experience for me. It's great for, you know, there's midweek games as well. It's not just two tests against Japan. It's um, it's a great chance for people in Wales to see what I can do. So um, I had a little bit of luck. Mark Jones got injured um, after the first test and Wales were in need of a winger. And I played wing, I played centre and, um, you know, they put me straight in. So it gave me a little bit of notice, which was great. Um, you know, I had sort of four days notice to say, look, Shanks, you're going to be um, playing this weekend. Um, gave me a chance to to call home. My dad flew out as soon as he could straight wow. away. Great. Um, you know, because it's it's a big moment for you, but I'd probably say it's a bigger moment for your family and yeah, your friends agree. because agree. they're yeah. the they're the ones that have followed you through this. You know, they're the ones that have lived it with you as well. Um, and you know, they're pro they're more emotionally invested in it. So. Um, he managed to fly out, which was amazing, amazing for him, amazing for me, for, for him to witness my first cap. And, and obviously being against Japan, it's it's quite a nice game. It's not like you're thrown yeah. in the mix against New Zealand. New got, Zealand, South Africa for your debut. Yeah. yeah, here we go. Try Mark Joe Rokokoko or Riku Gear. <laughs> um, and it was a game where, you know, we were never really going to lose. You know, Japan aren't, in 2001, weren't the team they are yeah. now. Um, so, um but what a great tour it was as well. Did you, you know, play well? Yeah, did all right. Scored two tries. Cool. Um, but it was a social tour, you know, because rugby was professional, but it wasn't yeah. as it is now. Um, so it was um, very enjoyable. You know, we got to do loads of stuff um, off the field as well as play a lot of rugby on the field. Um, you, know, it was, there's no, you know, we weren't told what to eat if we didn't like the Japanese local cuisine, we go to TGI Fridays or KFC yeah. or McDonald's and no one cared. <laughs> that, that's one thing you probably saw as a player right, you know, right throughout your, your professional career, the changes in the approach to rugby and the professionalism, things like that, like diet, having a pint after the games. Um, you know, what, what, what's your thoughts on how how the professionalism has progressed. It, obviously, there's lots of benefits to it, but do you think that we've missed out on some of the social side of it as well? You know, I've spoken to a few guys and there's a few a few have said, like, it's fantastic for the results and for the, the, the pure rugby, but for the enjoyment, it, it does tarnish it just a little bit. Maybe. Um, I think if you've lived in both those eras, then you'll know. I think the players, the new breed of players coming through now, it's a bit like footballers, you know, they're, they're super professional. Um, yeah. You've got bigger things to worry about as well, you know, like yeah. video cameras on phones, you know, even if you're just, you know, visiting a, a bar or you're out to have a drink of a soft drink, you know, yeah, of course, you get a photo take and that's it, you know, um, game over. So I think you can't miss what you don't know. Um, so I think it's just I think it's just the new breed of player coming through that is super professional. And look, there's there are players that slip through the net. Um you know, you look at James Davis, you know, still really lively, still very sociable. Yeah. Um, and there are, there's other players like that as well. But certainly when you look now and some of the the top Welsh players that are playing now, they're, they're pretty strict in their training and their recovery. Um, and you need to be because yeah. training is different. Rugby is different. It's far more intense. Uh, both, you know, the games are, but the training. Players train a lot harder now. Yeah, and 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 that's the difference at the elite elite level. Are just the little things like the the right amount of rest, the nutrition, the the technical um, training, the watching, the, you know, the the ability to watch teams. In you know, fifteen years ago, we didn't have YouTube or uh, access to internet forums where we could we we could look up an opponent. You know, a lot of it was blind when you were going into games. Or so. When did you, you, you were playing for Saracens, when did you move back to Wales? What year did you come back to the Blues? Uh, 2003, I came back. Yeah, um, was, that, was that always an objective for you? Is that something you, you'd always thought about? You wanted to come back and play for one of the, the Welsh teams? Well, I'd probably had a handful of caps and I just thought that if I want to really make a crack of, of playing for Wales, if I want to get um, 
more caps, which you do. You know, you get a taste of international rugby and you think, wow, this is amazing. You're playing in front of 75,000 people, you're touring. Um, you have to you have to be playing in Wales. And I thought it was the right decision. Um, I'd had a chance in 2002 um, to go to the Scarlets, uh, but I didn't think I was ready. I still wanted to uh, learn a little bit more where I was. And at 2003, um, the chance came again. Bob Norster and Di Young um, had contacted had contacted me to, to show interest. And I was still under contract, but I went to Saracens and I just said, you know, look, this is, this is my goal. This is where I, I want to play. Um, I want to play for Wales. And um, and they were fine with it. They were fine with it. They released me from a contract. It wasn't like I was going to another club side in England. Anybody you know, it was... Um, you know, my heart was in Wales. That's where I wanted to play, and um, signed for the Blues in 2003. And I did have an option to uh, to play for England as well, because um, obviously born there. Yeah. And um, I was playing for Saracens at the time, and um, it was um, back in 2000 actually. And I had a phone call on the way back from training one day, and I picked up the phone, and this voice comes on the phone saying, "Hello, Tom. This is Clive Woodward." And I'm like, fuck off, who is this? Who's yeah. taking the piss? And uh, I thought it was one of the boys because it was a bit of an easy target, being young and naive, really pale and ginger. And um, after about 10 seconds, I realised that it was actually Clive Woodward and he was asking if I wanted to be involved in the 2000 Six Nations squad. And uh, it took me by surprise, right, because I hadn't heard anything from Graham Henry, um, nothing from sort of the Welsh camp. And I said, oh, look, Clive, you're going to have to leave it with me and um put the phone down anyway the next day graham henry rings obviously word has spread yeah um, yeah of course yeah invites me into the welsh camp get capped at wales a eh? and uh and then sort of progress further and further and further and you know and achieve some amazing things with wales and i look back with no regrets at all yeah. I, I kind of because it's not as if i could be driving um a bentley or a land rover around highgrove like mike tyndall <laughs> so if i could be waking up next to zara phillips like 12th in line to the throne i'd rather i'd rather pay for my car um, i'd rather pay for my fuel i'd rather pay for everything um but no not at all. how could i make my father play for wales you know all my auntie's uncles yeah it's it, it, you know it's it, it's a family as you said the family had the have an impact on your decision making there as well did you did you sit down with dad and have a chat with him about it when when the offer came in off woodward yeah, of course. You know, he, you know, he's given me guidance all the way through, mostly to sort of stay off the booze, stay off the nights out, and uh, yeah. if you do go on one, you know, make sure you train the next day, try and get it out of your system if if that's even a thing. I don't know if it is, but it makes you feel better. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, if you if you look commercially, um, you know, England's far better. You know, you look at like a lot of the players that want to play for for England, like the Vinopolas and a lot of the South Africans that come over. You know, they're going there for financials really because it's a bigger corporate market but it wasn't it wasn't for me about that it was about where my heart was at you know and where i felt at home and wales is you know i'm still here now i, I won't i'll never leave yeah. well i say yeah. never leave everyone's got a price haven't they everybody's got a price with um let's talk about your first home international who was that against do you remember you know your first game for wales at at, at home and, and was it at the old arms park then no, no, it was uh, Millennium Stadium. Yeah, uh, it was France in uh, 2002 Six Nations. Yeah. And um, it was my second cap. And there was a lot of injuries. Um, Yesin Harris uh, and Jamie Robinson, I think, played against Ireland in the centre. Um, I think Jamie Robinson gets injured. Um, yes, Yesin Harris takes him a little bit of time to get into rugby union because he'd been rugby From league. The rugby, yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. Um, so I played in the centre with Andy Marinos, who was South African, but was at the Dragons at the time. And I mean, I, look, I, it wasn't like an instant success, you know, like someone like George North would have had coming in. But, you know, I got selected for that. Did OK, but nothing special. We lose a game yeah. right towards the end. Uh, close game all through. Then we play Italy the next game. Um, do all right in that, but get injured, get a... I get, I get a knee in the quad, like just a, you know what it's like, a severe dead leg where yeah, sometimes yeah. you can run them off. Other times they've just corked and you can't yeah. do anything. Um, so took me a while really to actually cement my, my place, not even 
in the, in the 22, not the first team, but the 22, because because of injuries. And that's why I say, you know, you can't judge people straight away on the, like, their opening performance for Wales or their debut for Wales, because it takes a little bit of time because it's nerve wracking. You know, it's a different scenario. It's a different yeah. situation. Yeah. The crowd is different. It's, it's a different level to what you're used to playing at. at Millennium club. Stadium, again, it must be so, you know, for, for, for players, depending on your mindset, some people will go out and thrive on that atmosphere, but at the same time, there's going to be players which will find it, you know, quite intimidating. Yeah, you know? it was. It, it is. It is. And, you, you know, it's because you're playing in such a, in such a, a crowd, um, noisy environment, which you're not used to. Um, you know, by the end, it's the only place you want to play. Because you yeah. get used to it, you feel comfortable. But yeah, yeah. certainly initially, it is quite nerve wracking. So, 70 caps for Wales, you know, fantastic career. But you had a few highs and lows as well in his re- regard to you were selected for the British Lions twice. Um, but unfortunately, injury played a part in y- y- your pro- progress on those tours. H- how did that feel, 2005? You know, wh- who contacted you? How did you find out that you, you know, you'd been selected for the British Lions squad? 2005 we found out on the radio um and we were training at the time and dan Barr, who um was at the cardiff blues he's now um sort of strength and conditioning um i think he's going to the dragons he was at wasps um came out um met us after training with um i think there was f- how many was there that was selected from the blues now um it was myself gethin jenkins martin williams was selected from the blues and um come out and uh, gave us a cigar each. Uh, <laughs> but I actually wasn't aware when it was actually going to be released. We, we knew it was around that time, but it wasn't like it is four years later or now, you know, on Sky Sports yeah, News, yeah. it's clearly yeah. marked, you know. So they announced it on the radio. He gave us a cigar. Thanks very much, Dan. Probably can't smoke this, but cheers. Um, and that's how we found out. Um, and then the next day, then all the Welsh players that get selected, we meet at the stadium and we do a photo shoot. But it was it was quite strange. But I remember four years later in 2009, where you're literally watching Sky Sports News and they're going through the names in alphabetical order. And so, so you're not contacted beforehand. That okay. that that's the process. They release it through through Sky News, yeah. and you you guys have given a time and guess to have a look to see if you're in or not. Yeah, it's like roulette. It's like when you're oh, yeah. when you've got a load of money on roulette. On black or red, and you're just waiting and watching and watching and watching, oh, and then that must be a stressful, uncomfortable scenario to be in, to be honest. Yeah, mate. I mean, yeah, you can't keep still. It's it's yeah. horrible. Um, yeah. But yeah, but look, I've selected on on both in 2005. I had to leave the tour early um, because I injured myself before going out on tour. I tore the lateral meniscus cartilage on my right leg um, in a in my, the last game. Basically, I had to play before. Um, meeting up and but I had a I had a quick operation had it quickly tidied up you know under the radar got myself on the tour got myself on the plane played um, three games and then just the swelling was unbearable having to have it drained um, yeah. two days before playing was you know it, it wasn't good and it was to the point where when Brian O'Driscoll was spear tackled um, into the floor Clive, yeah Clive Woodward said look if you're fit Shanks you're playing next week and I said Mate, this is the hardest decision I've had to make, but I can't. I, I wouldn't do myself justice. I wouldn't do the team justice. Um, looking back now, I wish I had because we were hammered, you know, 3 0. Um, yeah. But, you know, I wouldn't have made any difference whatsoever. But, um, you know, when you when you take the field, and same with you, you know, when you take it, when you're in the octagon or, or the ring, whatever it is, you know, people don't know what injuries you're carrying. They just assume you're fit. Yeah. Um, that's right. You know, you haven't got a sign in you saying, not quite fully fit. I'm 70%. I've got a bad shoulder. I've got a bad knee. So I just thought I couldn't do myself justice. And then in 2009, um, we played the the Dragons again, last game before we had to meet up with the Lions and just get my shoulder. Um, it popped out and um, doctor had to come on, put it back in. But obviously the damage is done then. Yeah, yeah. All the ligaments are stretched and um, had to have a open surgery. You needed the operation as well, so uh, so. Is there any senses of regrets there, you know, or, or is, are you one of these guys? Is look, it wasn't meant to be. Um, there's no regrets because you you know what can you do about getting injured? Yeah. 
um, yeah. you think, oh, maybe if I'd stepped off my right, or maybe if I'd, yeah. I've done this. Done. Yeah, you can't because it's so instinctive. You just do what you do. You know, there's no time to think on the field. So, no, there's there's no regrets. Um, if if I did have a regret, it probably would have been. I reckon it's only now you I can say this. You know, when you become a little bit older and a little bit more sensible, I wish maybe I'd I'd captained a little bit more. I'd done the on the odd game now and again for the blues i never captain wales but partly because i was like a big kid you know all i wanted to do was joke around all i wanted to do was like the role and you've turned it down no i wasn't no no i think they probably looked at me and thought he can't do it (laughs) too much of a piss taker (laughs) um and it's only now i look back and think yeah if i'd been a bit more mature about it it would have been it would have been a nice thing to do i think and uh, but there we are that's it though with um with your Welsh career, was it two World Cups you you competed yeah. in? How did you get on in both of those? Um, well, it was two thousand three was Australia, two thousand seven was France, and France didn't really feel like a World Cup. It was a World Cup, obviously, but you know we play two games in a Millennium Stadium. You know we're back yeah, and forth. Yeah. To me, that's not a World Cup. A World Cup is when you go to a country, you absorb it yeah, for yeah. six, seven weeks. And we did that in two thousand three, and that was. That was far more enjoyable. We reached the um, the quarterfinals against England. I wasn't playing that day. I was um, I was being rested, I think, for maybe the semis or the final um, slash dropped. But um, but it was it was an incredible time. You know, we we toured all Australia. Um, we started off in sort of Sydney. Um, we were in Melbourne. We were um, in Brisbane. We were on the Gold Coast. Everywhere, Canberra. Um, we're in self-contained apartments there we're quite young and these self-contained apartments have two bedrooms have a kitchen so you know we had an allowance every day to go out and buy food to cook for ourselves but you know we're 23 at a time not on a massive contract wanted to make as much money as we could so we worked out that if we bought porridge and beans we could survive off that all day and pocket like 100 quid a day um, until our weight started to go right down yeah and because uh, you obviously got you got to weigh yourself every day, and they caught wind of what we were doing, a little scam, and uh, that was the end of that. We had to eat out then. So, uh, but pheno- phenomenal time. I mean, World yeah. Cups are great every four years, um, but Australia was amazing because so it's 2003. It, there's a social scene that goes hand in hand with rugby at the time as well. So everything was a, was about going out, enjoying yourselves, going out. Um, enjoying the city, um, relaxing, having a good time, and, and turn up the next day to train. So um, we had a great time. We had a great bunch of players, a young group of players. There wasn't too many guys that were finishing at the World Cup. Um, Steve Hansen was in charge of us as well. Yeah. Um, and um, and we reached we reached the qualifiers and really gave England a massive, huge scare. But the game for me, uh, partly because you know I was involved in it as well, which was a bit of a turning a turning in a sort of tie for Wales really was New Zealand. We played New Zealand in the last pool game and no one expected us to do well. We had a, a mix and match team out. I was on one wing. Shane Williams was deliberating whether he's going to play or not because he felt quite ill. Um, and um, um, again, we run New Zealand scared. You know, they end up winning the game. Of course they do. But there was moments in that game where they were really under the, under the pump and Wales come out and played this rugby, which was just free you know there was no real game plan we just went out and it was one of the games that really turned wales into into the team they sort of become in 2005 and and look shane was having an arm whether they were playing or not you know if he if he hadn't played that game maybe he wouldn't have sort of bounced back from you know his first cap because he went he got capped by graham henry then steve hansen didn't really rate him I wanted a big wing i went for sort of david james um uh, on one wing and who was a Craig Morgan was on another wing and sort of Shane went as um, a sort of a third scrum half that could play wing Yeah, played that day had one of the best games I've ever seen him play uh, was phenomenal and never ever has he been dropped since yeah yeah well he's one of the most cap players I think as well isn't he now he's got to be yeah um, no he's not he's he, not now because players no. you know there's, there's a lot but yeah, yeah I think he's sort of near enough 80 90 caps but yeah. Scored more, more tries than anyone, and I'll be player of the year 2008. So yeah. he's done all right, I think. <laughs> and, and under the Welsh regime, um, obviously, and again, going back to you know, the old school days, where 
you you seen who she which, which coach do you feel came in and, and made the biggest difference of changing the mentality and the professionalism with, with regard to the Welsh setup? Mentality and professionalism it would have to be Gatland because yeah. he he bought as all Kiwis would do bring a, a winning mentality to yeah. it, but turned us way more professional you know we thought we were professional until you know we met this guy and it was a whole another level you know training was another level looking after yourself was another level everything um more intense and uh, you know than i can ever remember training you sometimes you get intense sessions um throughout your career and you think wow that was hard but you know to do that every day yeah um, so he certainly bought that player development for me um and knowledge of the game and understanding the game would be steve hansen and scott johnson because they grabbed hold of wales when we were in a transitional period graham henry had left a lot of players like scott quinnell rob howley they're all retiring new breed of player coming through you get that sort of circles every 10 years um of uh, you know the the new breed of player coming through and um but the way they took us of game understanding of knowing what to do in the right areas basic skill level you know they were they were brilliant at that um so a mixture of those two really but i mean i just remember when gatlin came in and everyone was just walking around with these massive eyes thinking oh my god what we've got to do that again tomorrow and the yeah. next day and the next day um but it's what wales needed you know we'd be uh, proud of the I world cup the results speak for this south under gatlin doesn't it you know it, it went from one of the you know, you went on to be one of the best teams in the world without doubt under, under Gatland. And the best thing about Warren Gatland was you'd walk past him and you'd sort of say hello or nod or have a ch little chat with him, getting a coffee, and he never knew whether he loved you or he hated you. you know, he, he, he kept his distance as a coach, purely professional. Yeah, yeah, he'd never really break down those barriers. You know, you'd have a laugh at him, but he, very, very professional, and and you you just couldn't tell what he was thinking. He's like a psychopath, you know. <laughs> Does he want to murder you? You know, does he? Uh, but but I, I think that's probably a trait in a, in in all what you would call world class great coaches. You know, um, yeah. they they are a bit different to your to your average man in as much as they're driven, as you said, bringing that um, that willingness to succeed, that that success above everything else. I suppose would have been his his mentality going into that Welsh job. Yeah, and he knew how to get the best out of players. You know, we Wales weren't, you know, probably individually we weren't the greatest team out there but he got the best out of everyone and, and we've seen that you know wales became a team you know the last two or three years that have forgotten how to lose um and they just grind out wins and i remember my 50th cap and it was italy 2008 and before we get to the stadium on game day we we set the Vale hotel uh, but just before we get on the bus to go to the stadium last few words from your coach and we're all sat in a semicircle in a horseshoe, one to twenty-two at the time. And Warren Gatlin comes in, all our bags on the bus. Last few words, and you know, he walks in his suit and tie and says, "Guys, you know, it's it's Italy today. Um, you know, let's not give them set piece. Let's keep the ball in play. Let's make them work. Let's tire them out. You know, we don't want to be giving them lineouts. We don't want to be giving them scrums. That's where the, that's what they want." And he said, "And finally, um, it's Shanks's fiftieth cap." And I've like sat up now, and I'm ready for. I'm thinking, oh God, what's what's the bugger done? Is there some sort of montage on TV? Is, <laughs> is <laughs> has he done a PowerPoint? And he goes, Shanks, when I was coaching Wasps and you with Saracens, we didn't rate you, fella. In fact, we <laughs> in fact we used to target you with fifty caps. Well done, boys on the bus, and that was it. I was thinking, oh, God. It's the biggest day of my Welsh career. I'm leading the team out for my fiftieth cap. I need a little bit of motivation. Um, and but what it, what it did for morale in the team was huge. The boys loved it. it was yeah, I bet they give a ribbon. Yeah. Oh, mate, they bloody kill me. But but it actually motivated me. I thought actually, you know, I'm going to use this. Um, it pissed me off. Um, but then we go on to win the game, and score a try, and uh, we and again we a, a great pass. psychological uh, yeah. twist off the off the great man himself. I, the, what's your thoughts on the current Welsh coaching team? Because they. they you know, to, to anyone that was going to come in and follow Gatlin, it's a big old set of, of, of shoes to fill, isn't it? And, and he's Sean Edwards, isn't that? Um, do you think these guys, are, uh, given time, are going to be successful? Like Alice Ferguson, isn't it? You know, following him. You know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a such a tough thing to do. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, but I think they've definitely got the right team. Um, I think we've seen that 
we've seen the way Wayne Pivak wants to play the game uh, yeah. from his time at the Scarlets. Um, really liked. Boys love him, which is great. Um, I think Stephen Jones is hugely important to the way Wales want to play. And, you know, we got stuck a little bit under Warren Gatlin with sort of Gatlin ball um, playing the same way. And that evolved a little bit um, and it needed to. But I think, I think we'll play more expansive rugby with this new um, regime with his with his new coach and staff um, really excited but it's one of these things that if it doesn't happen straight away you know yeah. give them time you know it happened straight away for Warren Gatlin because he took Wales when Wales were rock bottom we'd been knocked out the uh, World Cup by Fiji didn't even make a quarter final didn't make the final stages Warren Gatlin comes in and you know a little bit of luck but he's still got a good team we win a Grand Slam the first year he's in charge um that's not going to happen all the time. But I really do think we've got a very good team in charge at Wales. And if it doesn't happen straight away, let's not panic um, because it will. And it takes a little bit of time to get used to... Of course it does. That's, as you said, they're changing the style of play. Um, probably certain players they want to you know, get rid of, bring in. So there's going to be changes. And, you know, fingers crossed they do get that time to set, you know, because... You know, I, I know Stephen and, and Byron. I've met them. You know, by, Byron I've grown up with. I met Stephen on occasions, and you know, I, I just hope they're given the opportunity to to settle in and be successful. With yourself, then, a couple of questions that people are asking: Who's the best team that you played for? Uh, played for, and uh, that's the club. And 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 which, which are the Welsh area eras, and which are your eras as a club team were the best teams you played for? I think best team I played for would probably be the 2005 Grand Slam winning Welsh team. I just, I look back at that team and everyone complimented each other. Everyone knew their roles. Um, and the way we went about winning the Grand Slam, it wasn't like 2008 for me personally, you know, where it was just, a, we just relied on Shane Williams. That was it. Yeah. Get the ball to Shane. Um, everyone played their part. And um, so that, for me, that would always be a special one because of obviously Wales hadn't won in 27 years. So that was the best team I, I played in. Um, if you look at club level, I'd probably say the Cardiff Blues, again, around the same, same era. Year, yeah. Part Partly because I was injury-free back then. You know, I look back yeah. on, on my career now and part of me wishes I'd retired a lot earlier because I couldn't do the things I used to be able to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit soul-destroying when you look back and you can't move the same way. You can't train the same way because, you know, for me, it was a, a knee. It was no, it, wasn't it? I read yeah. Stuff, yeah. There's no cartilage in my knee. So a lot of things I couldn't do. And, you know, it's you sort of see yourself slowly getting worse and worse because you can't do the things. You know, it, you can't instinctively change direction as well as you could. You don't have that acceleration. I'm, you know, I'm 25, 26 at the time, you know, so I should be in my prime. But, um. But that's just that's just the way it is, you know. Sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. Probably as well, being you know, to 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 have played at the level you did, you're a perfectionist of sorts. You know, you want the best for you all the time, and that must be frustrating. I I experienced that myself. I remember, you know, having my, my last professional bout and thinking, I should have beat this guy a couple yeah. of years ago. Um, my brain was was saying all the right things, but the body was reacting just a couple of seconds behind. And I, I, knew, I knew halfway through that fight that this is going to be the last fight yeah. that, that I had. For somebody like you playing at that, that elite level, the frustration must have been overwhelming at times, I suppose. You know, as you said, when you can't move or you would have outpaced somebody or you would have sidestepped yeah. somebody on, 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 a, on a different year. You know, I, how, was that, how was that as a professional athlete to deal with, you know, mentally? Did it, did it take its toll on you? Yeah, it, it did. And when I retired, I was grateful. You know, it was it was actually a weight off my shoulder thinking, right, I don't have to take anti inflams every day. Yeah. I don't have to come home and worry, is my knee going to be all right for training the next day? Um, and I could have done, you know, at the moment, I don't run or anything, but I can I can walk fine. I can, you know, if I need to run because, you know, my, one of my kids is near a hot pan. And I was, you know, I can, I can yeah. move. I can move. <laughs> I can still play the odd game of touch, you know, once a month probably. But they come to a point where you can seriously do damage and yeah. um, I'm going to need a re knee replacement sooner rather than later. But it is, you know, I look back on how I finished playing rugby um, to how I was playing 
and how I can move and function in sort of five, six years before. And it's it's a different it's a different person whatsoever. So uh, and the but, position you know, the position you played in probably there's certain positions in a rugby team as you get older you can adapt a little bit for example yeah. second row when you're playing center as you did predominantly for, for your career there's no room for for any sort of mistakes there is it or you know yeah, and also you know we're institutionalized into playing rugby it's a job you know we don't what else are we going to do yeah. so you try and you try and cling into cling in on to that for as long as possible because you know i don't know what i was going to do after rugby um you know it takes people time to figure out what well, unless you're lucky unless you've got a skill or unless you're part of a family business, yeah. um, then, you know, it's it's quite daunting. So, you know, part of you also wants to stick at rugby and get paid at rugby for as long cool. as possible because it's all you know. Yeah. How, how old was you when you retired, Tom? Uh, just turned 30. So, so so what did you do? What was it? Did, did you get, did you have thoughts again into, into coaching or was that something you've never had an interest in? No, not really. Um I wanted to step away from rugby. You know, rugby is a big part of your life. Um, I just wanted to have a break from it. Um, didn't know what I wanted to do. So, and you try things. You try different things to see what works, to see what suits. Um, unfortunately, you know, you compare everything you do after rugby to rugby. You know, you've done your dream job yeah. already. So it's it's yeah. difficult. But you've got to get in the mindset that, you know, you, you have to work. At some stage, you know, you're going to have to work full days um you're gonna have to sit behind a desk but you've got to find something that you can tolerate and you can do and it doesn't often happen straight away you, you've got to try a few different things to actually work out what suits you've got to get the light you've got to get the work lifestyle balance right you've got to make sure you're at home you've got to make sure that you've seen your kids and, and it's quite a lot of things which you've got to tick boxes for to get right but you know when you do it, it's fine but but take you know take your time you know it, it's the advice I give to people, especially people from in a position coming away from sport and looking to find work, you know, find out what you enjoy doing, what you don't enjoy doing. Yeah, and I think that's important, particularly when, when, when you've been a pro sportsman, you've done something for the majority of your, your life up until that point, something you enjoy doing, something that you, you probably never saw rugby as a job. You've, you've got up and yeah. uh, uh, felt blessed to be getting paid to do something that you'd be doing for free if you weren't as good as what you were, yeah. you know. So, you know, it, I, I agree. Probably to find that um, that thing to fill the void, it, it, it is difficult and it's not going to be overnight. So that's, that's great advice. Put, put the feelers out, try a few different things, I'm guessing, is what you're saying, and find yeah. something that suits you, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I mean, people have to work. You know, you, rugby players aren't like footballers, you know, or cricketers to an extent. You know, you're not given... You, you're not, you don't have enough money to retire unless you're really lucky. Yeah. Um, but um but yeah i mean you don't know what you're going to do so you've got to do something and um often one thing leads to another thing so what what are you doing with yourself at the moment tom um well when i finished i, I worked for um a company called ds smith which were a um, recycling company now they sponsored cardiff blues and uh, they also sponsor um the group sponsor wasps so i was camp manager there but I realised that, you know, I enjoyed it. It taught me a lot about business. Um, but it's there's a lot of time on the road. You're essentially a rep. Uh, but I work in the event side now. So I work for a, a company called Gennaro. Um, so we do events. Um, we do hospitality. Um, obviously, the event industry and hospitality industry is ceased to exist at yeah, the moment. Yeah. So it's, it's tough times. But... Um, you know, I, I enjoy that aspect of it. I enjoy going to events. I enjoy putting them on. So um, I've gone into to business as well. I've joined a successful company, which my mate um, Peter Lecky set up. And, you know, he's got 20 years in experience as well. Um, so, you know, we've got to get through this tough time now, but things will come back online. They will, they will. They cannot not. You know, people are sociable. No one's going to want to do Zoom calls for the rest of their life. I can't stand them. If anyone yeah. says to me, do you want to do a Zoom quiz on a Friday night? I'm like that. Fuck off. <laughs> no chance. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, Bore off. We're, 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 so, we're social animals by nature, aren't we, human beings? You know, yeah. um, look at the social event when, when you play international in front of that, you know, Millennium Stadium. That's what people live for, those experiences, yeah. you know. So, fingers crossed, we'll have a bit of normality soon. I've got a couple of questions off um, people that have messaged me on Facebook, Twitter, and 
Instagram. So we'll finish off with a few of those. Who's the best player you ever faced? Um, well, I have to give an example from centre and wing. Because yeah. sometimes, because I, I was so quick, they put me out on the wing. I was like the, the quickest bloke in the team. Um, not, but I just had to fill in. Um, and I used to honestly I used to hate it when I'd be up against like Joe Rocococo or Brian Abana because to play on the wing I mean they they were ahead of their time really you know they to play on the wing now you have to have pure pace yeah you know you, you can't be like a bit of a hybrid bred like me you know you, you've just got to have outright raw pace and they did and you just can't defend it and but they never went around the outside of me because I was on a touchline, so they just got inside. But <laughs> I used to, oh, I used to hate it. I used to hate it. Um, but in the centre, then I'd say Brian Driscoll. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say Brian Driscoll because the bloke was the complete package. You know, he was great attacker, um, great passer of the ball, great kicker, great defender, great jackaler. Um, had everything. Great vision and unbelievably strong. Yeah. Um, so. He was he was always a difficult. And I'm sure most centres from my era would say the same. Say the same thing. Who's who's the best player you've played with? Um, Shane Williams is the obvious choice because he was phenomenal to watch. You know, he there, he had no position really on his back. He would just pop up wherever because he was. You won't see another one of him again. I don't think for and yeah. if you do, it'd be a long, long time. Um, because he was that unique and that different. Um, Stephen Jones, though, for me, was probably the most important to to my position because you know I had a fairly simple job. You know, you'd you tackle what's in front of you, um, and you'd hit strike. You'd be a strike runner. You'd hit lines, whether it's an inside angle, you know, hitting a hard line, whether it's an outside angle. Um, you'd be a you'd be a decoy. You wouldn't be a decoy because there's you know you, even if you called a decoy, you've got to expect the ball. Yeah. Um, and it was his job to to pick me out, you know, to hit me or to miss me. So he played a massive factor and, you know, 90% of the time he'd make the right decision and put me through holes. So he probably had the most influence on my career. When you um when you speak to, to Shane Williams next, ask him to hurry up and reply to my email as well, because I've emailed across to him this week for... Uh... For him to come on the podcast, I'm, I'm st- I have been told he's not fast at coming back with emails, so you've probably got a bit more detail on that. How arrogant has he become now? <laughs> yeah, unbelievable! Now you just said you know, you've got to you've got to put Iron Man or cycling as a header <laughs> on the email and you reply. Right, uh, you you've met. This is what somebody sent in. You mentioned recently in an interview that you're fed up of people thinking you're Gareth Thomas. Is this a regular occurrence? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, like all the time like I, I walk like obviously we're in lockdown now but a couple of probably two or three months ago I was walking through the middle of Cardiff and you know this homeless guy stops me and says I know you I know you I'm like yeah yeah he goes you're a rugby player aren't you I'm like yeah yeah and I'm like no I'm trying to get away because I'm, I'm meeting someone for a for a a business meeting and he's still he's trying to talk and he's going oh, i love you great you're great and i said like, oh thanks mate thanks thanks you know and I've sort of walked off and uh feeling a little bit taller and then all i could hear in the background was alfie i love you <laughs> um yeah I, I look i i just hope alfie has it as much as me <laughs> We um we got we got a similar story and one of one of the lads that fights in the UFC on a major Brett Johns. He this is back in he just made his debut for the UFC back in November and he come away with a great win. So he's gonna you know in, in MMA circles, you know, until you get that big show, you're not really noticed on the street. But once you're on the on the big card, then people start becoming a bit familiar. So he's walking through Swansea Town Centre and there's a, a group of lads who Oi, mate. You that guy from the UFC? And he says, you know, a bit of a chest. Like, yeah, yeah, that's me. Can we have some selfies? And a group of lads has come over, taking some photos and, you know, oh, cheers, mate. You know, we loved your fight. And then somebody came out of the chip shop opposite and said, who, who are you having photographs over there? He said, is that Jack Marshman from the UFC? It's a totally <laughs> different fighter. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I, I've had Neil Jenkins before. Bit. I've had yeah. Neil Jenkins before. Um, <laughs> I've been, Neil Jenkins hasn't even been playing in, in the team. <laughs> You know, the post warming up, and they've gone, Neil, Neil, turn around. It's obviously when I had hair. Right, oh my God, I've got, I got to go warm up in the middle of the field now. 
<laughs> right, this is my <laughs> this is my favorite question, Tom. How did it feel to become the first professional rugby player to appear in Horny Husbands in the Rodeo magazine? <laughs> <laughs> There's a Wikipedia page, right? Which... <laughs> That's what I think I see, because I Googled yeah. it, and I see it came up on your Wikipedia then. Yeah, and uh, well, first off, thank you for buying the magazine. Um, but <laughs> it gets doctored all the time, mate, honestly. I don't know who it is, but... Is there any truth in it? I wish it was. Um, <laughs> but I've been an ironmonger making suit of arms for Robin Hood. I've been yeah. a spice merchant importing spice my favorite spice is cumin or cumin whichever way you want to pronounce it um they've got my name as thomas george leslie shanklin um it's llewellyn yeah uh, so don't know who does it mate um and like sometimes there's sexual references as well and you know so i've been to schools before doing some campaigning for nspcc and the teachers have been like right kids if you don't know who this is when you get home just google it <laughs> wikipedia I'm like, kids don't do that please <laughs> Please. So there's, so there's no truth in it at all, is there? Um, not yet, but I am open to offers, mate. Well, it's, it's early days. You're, you're still I'll in your you, mate, I'm, in great, I'm in good nick. I'm a, I'm a lockdown <laughs> winner. I've got a little gym. I bought loads of equipment before we went down. So I'm on the bench every other day. I'm on the rower machine, I'm doing 21s on the arms. <laughs> right. Uh, what's the most memorable game you played in? There's first caps, there's fiftieth caps, but it, it would be the the Grand Slam game against um, Ireland, and yeah. the reason why is because we won the game as well in the Grand Slam. But we come out to sing anthems just before kickoff, and Ireland sing their anthem. It's brilliant, and you find yourself humming along to the anthem because it's a catchy one. It's one of the good ones. Um, but then just before we sing our anthem, Charlotte Church and Catherine Jenkins come out in front of us, and um, I don't remember it that well but charlotte was on the left catherine was on the right they had christian Louboutin shoes on they had ripped jeans um they had rugby tops on and sort of they'd thread the bottom over um through the top pulled it out the collar down so shown a lot of midriff and um looking up, um, you looking up to the heavens to pass ones you know i don't i don't know drawing strength on that but that day 22 players actually sorry 25 players because the ref and two linesmen were looking at about three feet off the ground because <laughs> it was it was brilliant um and uh, it's probably the only game we've ever started with all of us have massive smiles on our face <laughs> brilliant. right joe davis has asked who was on the golf buggy with andy powell no one famous it was his mate it was yeah. his mate um from brecon um said to him before i said to Pauli before like afterwards i said mate were you not scared when you're driving that golf buggy you know you're on the motorway and he's going oh mate it was the best day ever he said i had a bottle of wine in one hand and i was i was pulling down my hand when the lorries were passing saying do it do it and he said the lorries were honking their horn he said, it was amazing um no i mean great story quite dangerous um very funny though um if you know because no one was hurt predominantly um and uh but he, he lost his license he lost his license for 12 months he just bought a new jaguar as well so <laughs> so it was no no other internationals just a pal of his yeah yeah just a pal from brecker right. um who is the best coach if you could single single whether that be international coach uh, or club who's the best coach you've played for um it's the, loved to die young at Cardiff. Um, die young. I'll have to look at die young Steve Hansen and and uh, and Warren Gatland all for different reasons because yeah. you know yeah you're different ages and you know it's not as if we had one coach for Wales, one coach for for Cardiff all the time. You know, there's plenty of coaches have gone through. So um, it's those three. Mostly. Right. Question off your old pal Dave Corbett, who set this up for us. Yep. He's asked me to ask you about the time you were bodyguarding the kids' bouncy castle. And can you also explain how you became a crane driver in Panath? <laughs> we put on a festival in Panath, and uh, Dave was obviously doing the, the security down there. And we turn up in the morning, and this festival is going on on the seafront, right? So we've got everything neat. We've got like a downhill derby, 
Um, it's put on every year. And uh, we turn up in the morning about seven o'clock. There's this massive bloody crane stuck there, um, right in the middle of the road. And we're like, oh my God. You know, and it's up as well. The crane's not down. It's been stuck up. And, um, you know, we, how are we going to get rid of a crane? There's no one there. <laughs> the arm is fully out. It's a massive one as well. They've been doing some sort of filming down there. And anyway, um, I managed to, to in the, you know, on my own to lower the arm. And uh, and the driver comes and, and drives it away. Um, so everyone thanked me for that. Um, I basically held the button right while the driver sorted everything out. He said, hold that button and it worked. Um, and what was that? Oh, yeah, and the bouncy car. So oh, I make a good bouncer. Um, I sort of, you know, if you had a minute and a half on the bouncy castle, that was it. You know, you're not getting any more time. And kids don't listen to you unless you shout. So I ruled, ruled by the iron claw, mate. Fair dues, buddy. Right. Well, just one, one last question because. Um... He's a good he's a good friend of yours and a friend of mine. But many years ago, when I would my, my son had to do a school project, he had to pick a famous sportsman, and he yeah. comes back and says, "Dad, I want to do it on Tom Shanklin," which which is great. But there was no internet in those days in my house, particularly, so I didn't know where I would start to get any sort of information. And Chris Anderson, yeah. um, who I was working, ah, I know Tom Shanklin. Well, I'll I'll get you something off Tom. But it took me about it took me about five six days, and in the end, I had to threaten him because. Uh, the deadline is like two days away, and he's. But he did turn up with um, a, a pair of Welsh rugby shorts, which he had signed. Now, yeah. the rumours are that this might have been a fraudulent pair of shorts. Is there any <laughs> truth in it? I doubt it. I doubt. It. I mean, I joke at the start <laughs> saying it's forged, but um, now nah, it's something I would do because I'm just a great bloke all round. Um, and I, yeah, I know Chris well. He came on a bike ride with me from um, Cardiff to to Paris before, so. Um, yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah, he'd come on a bike, come on a bike ride, um, and then he had to shoot back to play a game for uh, Roslyn Park, I think it was, who he was playing for at the time. And lo and behold, does 400 miles in four days, turns up the next day, plays Roslyn Park, pulls a hamstring. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but no, yeah, it's something I would do. So I'm sure they're real, all right. And uh, it's mud stains, not skid marks, as well. Right? Did, did you did you ever see Chris Anderson get dirty in a game of rugby? That's another question. Um, a very good point, actually. Um, no, he was a pretty boy outside half, wasn't he? You know, he didn't like yeah. Him. Well, I wouldn't say he's pretty, but you know, he played like Rob Andrew, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> like Colin Stevens. I might give him a call after this, right? Well, Tom, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your day, mate. It's been a really enjoyable chat. Um, I'm sure the people watching this now, when it gets uploaded, it'll take a lot from it as well. Um, is there any any websites or anything you want to push that I can put onto the uh, onto the platforms for you? No, mate, it's fine. It's fine. Nothing. The only thing that's a bit unnerving is obviously this is a Skype call, and uh, if I was ever to do it again, mate, I'd just ask if you did it in close. <laughs> Fortunately, it's going to be a split screen when I upload it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tom, Tom Shankling, thank you very much, mate. It's been no, an absolute no pleasure talking to you. Um, and hopefully we'll get to do this uh, in, in the future as well. I've really enjoyed it. Pleasure. Cheers, pal.